Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for human factors, psychology, and design. All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. This is your guest host, Elise Hallett, and I am joined by Dr. Mertide Alfred, who uh, is with the Medical University of South Carolina. Hello, how are you? Hello, everyone. Hello, Elise. It's good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, too. I know we we met in person a couple healthcare symposiums ago, and <laughs> here we are meeting virtually, so it's good to see your face. Yeah, kindred <laughs> spirits since then. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it is so good to have you on the show. Um, at this conference in particular, I was able to catch quite a few of your panels and, you know, just talking about some of the work that you've been doing over this past year and even before this past year. Mm -hmm. um, but before we jump into that, I was actually hoping if you could rewind a little bit further past that and talk a little bit about how you got involved in human factors and what ultimately led you to the role that you're in now. Well, it, it depends on how far you want to go back. It's quite a convoluted story. So as an undergrad, I was actually a history and a business major, right? So um, I, I, I joke that I was an industrial engineer before I knew I was an industrial engineer. And so I was actually working in banking, um, you know, checking folks accounts for, you know, fraud and, and, you know, mortgage fraud and things like that. And I had a friend who was a IE um, at the bank. And so she encouraged me to go back for my uh, graduate degree. And so when I went to Clemson, that's when I, you know, found out about human factors through my advisor, Dave Nyans, who taught the intro to human factors class. Um, and he kind of roped me in because I went in just for a master's, really, because I actually thought I was going to go back to banking. And then Dave's like, hey, I think you should do a Ph.D. And then my friend Kapil was like, yeah, you should definitely do a Ph.D. And I was like, OK, yeah, that sounds good. And so that was kind of that was kind of my path to, to human factors. That's awesome. And then did you get your Ph.D. at Clemson as well or? I, I did. I, I went in for the master's. It's funny. I, I did not even buy furniture in my apartment. I, I had my plan. I was going to be at Clemson for a year and a half. Um, and then, you know, I decided to just stay on and continue to the to the Ph.D. program. It, it made sense. And it was a great, great decision because Clemson did have a pretty strong human factors program in engineering and also in psychology. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And it's so funny always hearing about these stories of how people get into human factors, because I feel like it's it's one of those new fields that not a lot of people know about. And it, it's always like this very circuitous route, it feels like. I, I, um, know, I, I doubt there's anyone who kind of went into school and thinking, you know, I'm going to become a human factors engineer. You probably don't even know about it until you have at least an undergrad or you're, you know, working on your undergrad degree. Right. Yeah. So when you were, you know, getting your PhD at Clemson, mm -hmm. did you know that you wanted to go into the healthcare route or was there a particular area that was of more interest to you? Yeah, I actually, my, my, my dissertation research was looking at virtual environments, how we learn and design virtual environments, but, but I always had an interest in, in health. Um, and then, you know, when, when um, Ken, D Dave and Ken, so Dave's my advisor, Ken Catchpole is my postdoc advisor at MUSC. Um, Dave and Ken ha had been working on a project together and Dave let me know that Ken was looking for a postdoc and I thought it would be a great opportunity for, for me to fit into healthcare um, just because I knew it was an interesting and growing field and you know, I thought, you know, why not? Absolutely. Um, and I know Ken was our mutual contact and how we yes. met each other. Um, so it's always funny how those things, you know, work out and virtual learning in virtual environments. There's definitely some irony there given <laughs> the situation we're in right now. Um, I, I know. But, I, I, might, I might pick pick some of that research back up actually now. <laughs> you should. It's very relevant, I hear. Yeah. Um, so you know, you've you've been at um, MUSC uh, for uh, a few years now, right? Mm -hmm. Three and a half. So excellent. Um, so tell me a little bit about 
you know, the work that you were involved in, what your role looked like, you know, before COVID-19 broke out? <laughs> so I came into MUSC as a, as a postdoc, um, and I'm now a research assistant professor. Uh, but, but basically, since I've been there, I've, I've mostly worked on, you know, different patient safety projects, um, mostly in perioperative uh, safety or in peri perioperative care. Um, and so my, my role, I think, has been pretty cool because for the, for the most part, I do focus on research, but at the time, I actually get to support like quality improvement in the hospital. I get to kind of meet with our patient safety team. I get to sit in on the root cause analyses. And so it's been this nice kind of balance of, of being able to do research project that's longer and, you know, you might not readily see the impact. And, and being able to actually contribute to to patient safety projects in the hospital, so that's been that's been pretty cool. And then, um, you know, we we don't work as closely with students, but but you know, once in a while we get to work with a couple medical students, and and that's always nice because mentoring um, is something you know something I enjoy and I've I've missed in in this position. So it sounds like a a few different areas that you get involved in. And I, I should have prefaced our conversation with talking about how, you know, you have this unique role as a human factor specialist who's really embedded in the hospital environment. And, you know, a lot of times when we talk about human factors, we talk about the, the work we do with developers or kind of on the, um, you know, device side, whether that be an in industry or medical devices or, or wherever, but, you know, I look at this role as really like human factors in the wild, like in this messy hospital environment and, you know, figuring out how to invoke change in, in that kind of environment, whether that be through the long-term research studies, like you're talking about, or like embedded with, you know, particular teams at the hospital. So I just, I find that to be such a fascinating and unique position for a human factors person to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and over the past, you know, year or two, you know, they've really been, you know, within healthcare, but kind of as a separate thing, there's been a growing kind of recognition of the differences in the role between the human factors folks who are embedded in healthcare and, and some who might be at a research institution for some of the reasons you just named, right? You know, we have this this direct kind of, you know, opportunity well, we're, you know, we're, we can be more or less integrated with, with the clinical operations, but we have this direct opportunity to, to impact patient, patient care and patient safety. Um, and, and in my case, patient equity um, a little bit more readily than, than we can, I think, if we were just focused on research. Yeah, and some of the the projects that you had mentioned, you know, both in times, you know, conferences past that I've been a part of, and then also mm -hmm. this year's, um, you know, you talked a, a little bit about your work with, you know, studying flow disruptions in the operating room or mm -hmm. evaluating system safety in the non-operating room anesthesia, um, just so many different realms. So, you know, I'm sure you're involved in a lot of different projects. What are some you know, that have been some of your favorite to work on, again, pre-COVID, and because and, I know that has changed a lot of, of what you do. Yeah, so um, the, the project that I was brought in to, to work on was around surgical instrument reprocessing, um, and it doesn't seem interesting or exciting, but but it, it was really a great project and a, and a you know, a opportunity for us to really expose I think the complexity of a work of the work in a way that that had hadn't been you know uh, previously illuminated, and so I really enjoyed that project. I really enjoyed um, the people I met working on that project, and it's been nice because it's been a combination of research, but also a lot of our quality improvement stuff have has been you know have, have been related to sterile processing because of you know the the expansive research project we did. Um, I'm actually working on a project right now around how do we assemble chest retractors, supporting the, the reliable assembly of chest retractors um, in sterile process. And so that was a great project that I really enjoyed um, working on. And then the work I've been doing recently in, you know, maternal care, looking at 
um, you know, how clinical systems contribute or, you know, contribute to maternal health disparities and just what we can do um, to, imp to reduce adverse events in, in maternal care. And so, so um, that's, you know, my first research project as a, as a PI. Um, and so that's, that's been very exciting. And, and you know, I, I mentioned, you know, pivoting into healthcare, and that was one of the, the, the things I knew I would work on you know, if I took a role in healthcare was was maternal health and specifically finding ways to apply and leverage human factors and reducing maternal health disparities. I love that. So what with that project that you're, um, you know, focused on right now, what kind of things are you looking into uh, with respect to um, maternal care? It's 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 pretty wide open, you know, um, so so I think, you know, I, I I like to start with just kind of a broad investigation. There, there are, you know, there are factors that we know we, we should focus on, like urgent and emergent cesarean deliveries, right? Those tend to be high risk procedures. We know that there are, you know, specifically when we're thinking about um, complications for, for African-American women, we know that hemorrhage and, you know, transfusion tends to be a challenge. So, you know, do we do we have a robust massive transfusion protocol, right? Um, you know, there are issues around quickly um, um, identifying women who are declining. And so do we have decision support? Do we have mechanisms to really support, um, you know, nurses in their decision making around patients who might you know, who might be declining either slowly or, or quickly. And so those are some of the areas we, we know we need to, to focus on. But, but I'm sure after we complete our systems investigation, there's going to be, you know, a lot more. And so it becomes about, you know, trying to find those key areas that we can impact to, to reduce um, adverse outcomes for all women, but specifically to, to, to try to reduce the, those outcomes that impact women of color, um, you know, disproportionately. That's fantastic and such important work. Um, so it sounds like with that work, you've been looking at kind of the process as a whole mm -hmm. and, um, you know, especially how that process might change depending on the demographic of women that are coming in and then kind of pinpointing, you know, the challenges across the demographics and then mm -hmm. for particular demographics, you know, specifically women of color to then help narrow in your, your, your research and, and follow on investigations. Yeah, you, you said that so well, I should, I should rec recruit you to join the <laughs> team. But, but yeah, I, I think, I think the challenge is, is, you know, we, we talk about, you know, we talk about racism and specifically anti-Black racism, but, you know, I always joke that there there aren't like these cartoonish villains that are existing to hurt, you know, women of color. And so trying to find out, you know, how the design of the system, you know, negatively impact certain women. An easy example is, is non-English speaking women, right? We don't tend to have the, the strongest interpreter services. And so that puts them at a disadvantage. Um, but, but, you know, trying to kind of uncover those those ways that you know the system is designed um, and it negatively impacts certain women versus you know specifically focus on implicit bias, which which is part of the issue. But I but I think the 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 design of the system and how the institutional the institutionalization of, of bias is is a little more insidious, but also much more difficult to to tease out. Um, but but I think human factors. Um, is is that's where we add our value as as human factors, right? To support all the work that's being done, you know, by public health and folks at the policy level. We we know that a lot of maternal um, poor maternal outcomes are preventable. Um, so so what's happening in that clinical system that we can improve to to reduce these preventable adverse events? I mean, that's you know that's what patient safety is about, right? Absolutely. And it's it's so, so important for a lot of reasons going on right now, at least, you know, for me personally. Um, but it's it's so good. And it's such a good point that you bring up because, you know, as human factors professionals, you know, we're here focusing on the user, right? Who is mm -hmm. the end user? And so, yeah. you know, understanding the the variety that can come with, you know, who that user might be and then really using that 
to, you know, inform our our systems thinking lens and perspective that we bring into some of this problem solving. Yeah, exactly. And and I think um, I think sometimes we can we 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 tend to think of systems as as a little colorblind. And so, you know, when we look at our safety efforts, it it can be uncomfortable to to then try to kind of break that down by by particularly by by racial and ethnic demographics right because we want to believe that we're you know we're, we're designing safety with everybody in mind right and and we are but at the same time we have to recognize that you know different parts of the system might have different impacts on on certain people and so if we're you know just because we're focusing on safety for certain people doesn't mean that you know we don't we don't care about the safety of of all women it's just recognizing that right now the way our system is designed it's hurting certain women more more than others absolutely um it also kind of jogs in my memory one of the panels that i sat in on um where you were talking about you know now kind of moving into the covid realm um mm -hmm. some of the work that you did there and uh, specifically with hospital wayfinding, I think it was called. Is that is that the term? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, for our audience members, just like really understanding the flow of of people traffic, how people mm -hmm. are literally going to be moving through the hospital, and he brought up that that um, use case of you know the the only door that you can enter in, but it didn't include a, a ramp for you know the the wheelchair users um mm -hmm. which i found you know interesting and that was where you like really you know honed in like we as human factors professionals you know should be understanding you know the different demographics and and that was one case where i believe you said human factors you know was not involved and that was something that had been kind of uncovered after the fact um but i was wondering if you could you know elaborate a little bit more on you know that particular work and and um, how your role as a human factors person uh, fit into, you know, that that project. Yes, specifically with the, with the wayfinding, um, and and this involved both both Ken and I. Um, it, it was really around. We I think we focused more on foot traffic than we did, you know, vehicle traffic. Um, but but yeah, so MUSC like like you know a lot of hospitals, um, you know, limited their their entry and exit points right during during COVID to, to try to control traffic in and outside the hospital. And so I already, you know, you already pointed out the example of that, including the wheelchair entrance being closed. Um, and, and it was interesting um, because it was several months later that that ramp was, was finally kind of built. And it was like, wow, like how, you know, how, how had our <laughs> wheelchair patients been, been, been getting in? I, I imagine they have, but, but with a lot of, a lot of unnecessary um, challenges. And so, yeah, it was around, you know, finding ways to 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 get, you know, patients who needed to get COVID testing, um, patients who needed to go to the ED, patients who needed to get into the or visitors who needed to get into the hospital, and the same for for staff. Um, and and so I think, you know, when we thought about our user groups, those were, you know, those were our two main user groups, um, patients and families, as as well as um, staff. And so I, I think that, you know, this goes to our point, you know, I don't, I don't think in any of those conversations, I, for example, brought up the wheelchair issue. It wasn't something that I, I noticed um, un, until later, you know, and it was like, damn, like, you know, there's, there was no, there was no wheelchair thing. And, and as a human factors person, like, you know, I, I didn't personally bring it up. Um, you know, I don't know if, if someone else um, in the team actually, actually thought about that, but, but a lot of the work was really around signage right and so we had oh my god they, they were so bad i wish i had i had pictures but you know we had different colors and you know different sizes and then we had signs where there was something written on the sign and they took a paper and taped it over the sign and wrote something else it was it was just a nightmare and and so um you know we supported you know um some consistency in the sign using different colors for you know, use this color for the ED, use this color for uh, COVID testing, use this color for the main hospital um, and, and be consistent, you know, for people who are coming out of the, the parking lot and, and or the parking garage and, 
and things like that. So that was that was one of the big projects that we were involved we were involved in around COVID. Um, we worked on a couple more. I didn't know if you you know wanted me to elaborate on those as well. Yeah, let's dig into it. <laughs> so the the other uh, the other two and and I'm I'm being mindful of our our time. Um, the the other two was around an uh, interest in COVID ICU boot camp and. Um, that that was a cool project that I wish we had been involved in a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I think our department chair, I think, was forward thinking and recognizing that, um, you know, these our COVID ICUs were going to get filled and we were going to need people to staff those ICUs who don't normally staff ICUs. And so how do we get, you know, our anesthesia providers quickly trained up to take on this intensivist role, right? And so that's why they, you know, um, developed the COVID ICU boot camp. Um, after the conference, actually, someone reached out to me um, in in Ontario because they're they're going through their third wave and they're they're expecting that they might have a similar kind of shortage where they'll they'll quickly need to train providers to to work with patients that they haven't normally worked with. And then the same for um, adults and peds, right? Pediatric physicians and intensivists are being asked to care for adult patients that they don't normally care for. And so we we really just, you know, spoke to them about the design of the training, um, how, who who they were selecting and, and why, who made mo most who made the most sense. Um, and so that was a that was a that was a neat project and and I think one that they were able to to execute pretty successfully given given how quickly they were required to do so. Um, then we did, we did a couple projects that involved usability testing for a COVID tracing app and then, um, around remote ventilator monitoring, we did a bigger, you know, a bigger usability assessment with nurses and physicians and, you know, I think we use SUS and TAM. So you're kind of real human factors -y kind of assessment. The classic, and right? <laughs> So, so that was fun. The, the last thing I talk about, and this involved both me as a human factors professional, and then just me as a, you know, a, a black woman who's who's very um, vocal about equity, was was around, um, you know, just just trying to 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 stay on the hospital about, you know, being equitable on how we were doing COVID um, testing and and vaccination, right? Because we saw drive through testing sites and you know, some people are going to be left out, right? You know, people who don't have access to, to vehicles. I don't, I don't know if they were allowing Ubers to, to drive through, <laughs> drive through and get those. I don't know if you would want to take an Uber to, to get, get your COVID test. Um, and then the rollout was mostly through a virtual platform, right? So now we're losing people who, you know, are not as comfortable using, using, um, technology or who don't have access to technology or the Wi-Fi. And so, you know, we're, you know, those those disparities came out pretty quickly. And then we essentially kind of did the same thing with vaccinations. Um, fortunately, I think, you know, we quickly opened up like a call center um, that that, you know, supported people being able to to um, schedule their vaccinations without having to go through the virtual visit website, um, you know, which isn't difficult, but is, you know, is harder than, than picking up the phone and calling. And I want to say we did have Spanish Spanish speaking options for for our call center, which would also support equity. So those were kind of the major COVID projects that I worked on. It's a good number, a good variety <laughs> there. Um, with the the work that you did early on with testing, and then mm -hmm. some of the um, issues, you know, impacting equity and equal access to the testing. Did any lessons learned from there directly go into considerations for the vaccine rollout? Mm, I can't, I can't speak to that a hundred percent. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, I can only speak to what I've seen. And, and so I, I, I found it disappointing that knowing what we knew that, that the rollout still initially offered via a virtual platform. Right. Um, you know, but, but it's possible it was, you know, that was just the easiest way to do it until the call center could be up and running. But, you know, we, we knew we were getting vaccination. So that, that could have been a little more pro proactive. Um, and, and then I think, 
you know, the, the MUSC Black faculty were the group that I think really um, tried to um, think about potential hesitancy and, and concerns around the vaccination pretty, pretty early. Um, I, I will say, you know, our, uh, I think, think her role as chief quality officer did have conversations that, that were mostly focused on um, hospital staff around vaccination um, to, to, to answer any questions and, and concerns. Um, but in terms of community outreach, uh, we, we weren't necessarily ahead of the game. And, and I think the MUSC Black faculty really took that on head, you know, head on in terms of being vocal with the hospital, but also reaching out to the community. Um, you know, one of our one of our public health, um, uh, she's an endowed chair um, in public health. You know, she actually spoke to to my community group. I asked her to come and speak to my community group um, to discuss their concerns regarding the, the vaccines. Um, so yeah, it's possible that lessons were learned and that just for reasons of, you know, uh, ease or simplification, they had to do some of the same things, um, drive through vaccinations as well as virtual rollout um but they did that and those those disparities once again kind of you know revealed themselves and so you know efforts were then kind of made to to close the gap but um i i think it it, it could have been it could have been more more proactive gotcha and it's you know, it's definitely a good lesson learned, I think, for the human factors community at wide of, you know, really making sure that we're considering all of our end users, you know, regardless <laughs> of uh, the variety. And, you know, even if sometimes that means what we're putting forth makes it more difficult for us to put it forth. Um, it's, you know, ultimately making sure that, you know, we're we're meeting users where they're at and meeting their needs. So it's it's a good lesson learned, I think, for all of us. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes there's we can we can be hesitant to bring up, you know, particularly issues of of equity. You know, we're we're not mm -hmm. the we're not the most well versed, you know, in, in those issues. But um, like I mentioned in my talk, you know, be, because of and, and particularly for those folks who are embedded because of the access we we have, you know, we're, we're going to be in meetings about, you know, patient safety and and some of these other hospital related challenges that, you know, our colleagues in, in public health who, who are a little bit more um, informed on, on these equity issues are not. Um, and so I think being being willing to just bring them up um, is, is important, right? Um, and, and to your point, um, you know, we just because they're, they, they are user groups, you know, know thy user is one of the you know, the, the, the biggest kind of um, principles of, of, you know, design. And so being able to say, hey, have we thought about, you know, folks who might have challenges accessing, you know, drive through sites or, you know, have we thought about folks who, who don't speak English? Just just being able to to, to just raise those points, um, I, I think, is, is important and, and would be valuable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, a lot of great considerations. It sounds like you were involved in, you know, such important work um, through the hospital as a human factors specialist, both in terms of, you know, just getting people from point A to point B, but then also raising these issues of, of equity and some of the larger scale issues that, you know, some of the rollouts may have implications for. Out of curiosity, you know, how, how did you get involved um, with all these different projects as, as, you know, a human factors, you know, a professional. Yeah, it, it was, it was different, different people really. So, you know, with, with the COVID ICU boot camp, that was really our department chair kind of emailed both Ken and I early and said, Hey, we're doing this thing. I think y'all can add value. So I, you know, I would like y'all to be involved. Um, most of the work came through our patient safety team. We, we work very closely with, with them. And I think, them more than any other groups in the hospital, I think, understand and recognize the, the value we can bring to some of these different projects, even if it's just a, hey, what do you think? They're willing to kind of, you know, shoot us an email and or ask us to sit in on a meeting. Um, our informatics team, we've, we've worked with more on a research kind of, 
kind of uh, it's more more been a research partnership. And so, you know, they they kind of understood that we would it would make sense to leverage us for usability testing um, and, and the equity stuff stemmed from, you know, my role on MUSC's black faculty, as well as um, some great work being done by our patient and family centered care steering committee, which I was asked to join um, sometime last year. That's awesome. It sounds, you know, the theme that I hear a lot of times is it's really, you know, built on these relationships, either relationships that, um, you know, the human factors team has with other teams, or it sounds like in some of your situations, the the personal relationships, just, you know, based on the groups that you are a part of, um, and how, you know, those relationships really turned into something powerful when this global ban pandemic hit out. Um, or, you know, hit everywhere and they, you know, already had that relationship and knew to, to turn to, you know, the Ken and you um, as a human factors team. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. You know, when I discuss one of, one of my lessons learned from, from the panel at, at the healthcare symposium, um, that, that was one of the things that was, that was clear, like, you know, when, when something happens, <laughs> you know, having, having those relationship in places already in place helps, right? Um, you know, I, just because I think there were other projects we could have, you know, the, that huge adoption of telehealth, I think we could have really added, you know, value there, but we hadn't worked, you know, with our telehealth folks before. And so that kind of, that rapport wasn't already there. And so, you know, something happens, they're not necessarily gonna reach out to us immediately um, in the way a patient safety team would. And so starting, you know, starting to show your value and build those connections before something like this happens where where um, you want to be involved, I think is is helpful. I, I will say, you know, listening to the panel with other embedded human factors folks, you know, they had different experiences where where, you know, there were certain people who were more willing to kind of pull them in and say, yeah, we're going to you know, we're going to use our human factors team on this project versus, um, you know, us kind of dependent on on some of our personal relationships. So so I guess it's, it differs based on, you know, your level of integration in the hospital, as well as kind of your your champions um, in, in the hospital. But but yeah, I think and I think in general, having those relationships already established um, lead to better results in terms of people really pulling you into to projects where you can add value. That's such a great, I think, tip for our audience, you know, all the aspiring human factors uh, folks who are out there, um, you know, really, you know, the, the relationship aspect is so important because human factors does not work in a bubble. Um, you know, that's something that I've experienced in my work, and it sounds like it's something that you're experiencing, but um, it's really built on those relationships, you know, across the team, across disciplines. Um, and then, you know, those relationships will ultimately feed it back in them pulling you into opportunities and, um, you know, various work based on that. So it's it's such a good point. Yeah. I mean, you know, some some people don't know who we are or, or what we do. And, and, you know, we've talked about how it, it can be a little challenging to to easily demonstrate like, you know, your your value, your ROI. Um, but but when you do, you'll you'll have those repeat customers. Absolutely. So as you know, someone who is embedded in the hospital, are are you out of the COVID related projects? Are you still working with things related to COVID? How is your role looking like now? I, I would say at this point, we're, we're not as involved in, in the COVID um, re related projects. You know, Charleston. Um, fortunately wasn't hit as hard as we anticipated. So, so we had a, you know, a, a period in the summer where it got, where it got rough, but once that subsided, um, you know, it's, it's kind of been business, business as, as usual. Um, and so, you know, we haven't, we haven't had much COVID related work, um, fortunately. So you can focus on some of the projects that you talked about in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, starting to to really ramp up on uh, you know, my my maternal my maternal care research since uh, you know, that's that's a pending funding right now. 
Well, I will keep my fingers crossed for you on that regard. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, but Martit, this has been so awesome having you on the show and talking about your experiences. Um, if our listeners have questions or want more information about any of the research that you're doing, uh, where can they find you? Where can they find more information? Uh, easiest contact is, is probably LinkedIn. Um, you know, search up Mertied Alfred. I promise you there is not another Mertied Alfred in this world. <laughs> you will you will find me, uh, assuming you spell my name right. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter, but I'm not super active on Twitter. And, um, you know, I'll pro provide a lease with my with my email address so you can you can hit me up via email as well. Perfect. And we will have all those links ready for everyone in the show notes. So uh, that is awesome. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to come chat with us. You're, you're welcome. Thank, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So before I wrap up completely, we always end the show with the classic. It depends because as you know, in human factors, that is you know, my stakeholders know that that is usually the answer that I will give them if they have a question for me. <laughs> so I'm going to do a countdown and then we'll both say it together and then wrap it up. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Perfect. All right. On the count of three, one, two, three. It depends. It depends. <laughs>